Hello, everyone. Good morning to those that are on this side of the Atlantic in uh, Eastern Standard Time, and good afternoon to those that are in Europe and other regions. Thank you so much for joining us today for this one hour webinar, which is part of Open Government Week, um, which is hosted by Open Government Partnership. And this week is aimed to share lessons learned and push for ambitious action plans and policies to strengthen open government and democracy throughout the world. And it's meant to bring together open government reformers inside and outside of government with countries, citizens, governments, and civil society all over the world joining in the conversation. This webinar is hosted by International Idea and Accountability Lab in partnership with the Open Government Partnership as host of the week. And we are all partners in the Global Democracy Coalition, which is a coalition of more than 80 democracy organizations throughout the world that have come together ahead of the first summit for democracy to collaborate together with the aim of strengthening our collective voices in shaping the global democracy agenda. So it is in this framework uh, that we wanted to organize this session on the Summit for Democracy, on how the summit process and the year of action can support open governance and strengthen democracy globally. As you may know, the United States government announced in 2021 that it would host two summits for democracy to bring together countries and civil society leaders to shape a global agenda for democratic renewal. Over 200 participants joined the virtual summit in December 2021, and 2022 was dubbed the year of action ahead of the second summit to be held in the first half of 2023. Since then, the global democracy landscape has profoundly changed with the war in Ukraine, challenging many of the assumptions that underpin the first summit, but also highlighting the importance of following through on these commitments, particularly those related to strengthening to strangling rather transnational kleptocratic networks that enable authoritarian regimes to sustain themselves, but also fighting malign attempts at foreign interference of different kinds. At the first summit, countries made verbal commitments to strengthen democracy at home and abroad, and were asked to submit written commitments to be implemented during the year of action and to be reported on at the second summit. And the second summit will be an important opportunity to take stock of how democracy has progressed between both summits. And these commitments, the, particularly the written ones, are an important accountability mechanism for civil society and citizens to hold governments to account for the implementation of these commitments. So far, 59 out of the 98 countries that participated in the summit, so around 60% of countries that participated in the first summit have submitted written commitments. And of those, more than two thirds focus on open government, including measures to fight corruption and to increase transparency and access to information. An important initiative also launched by the summit organizers have been the creation of thematic multi-stakeholder cohorts that aim to bring together countries, civil society, and international organizations and experts around specific focus areas of the commitment. For example, labor rights, financial transparency, or civic space. As a year of action is taking shape, we wanted to organize this session to hear the perspectives of both countries that are actively engaging in the Summit for Democracy process, as well as civil society organizations to hear how they are engaging in the year of action and how they view the summit process and its role in strengthening both the open government agenda and the global democracy agenda. So we would like to hear from the panelists how the Summit for Democracy Year of Action can help bolster democracy, build accountability, and ensure open governance. And also how they think the Summit for Democracy process can adapt going forward to ensure sustained results. So we are very lucky to have with us today government representatives from Norway and Canada and civil society representatives from Nepal and Congo DRC to hear diverse perspectives of the summit process from both older democracies in the north as well as newer democracies in the global south, both from the government perspective, but also from the point of view of civil society. So thank you so much to the panelists for taking your time today to be with us and share your views and contribute to this important discussion. Special thanks from International IDEA to Canada that we have the honor to have as chair of International IDEA's Council of Member States. Uh, in 2022, and also to Norway, a long-standing partner and valued member state of international idea. 
Uh, we will start the session, the panel discussion, hearing the views from our panelists on a few questions that we will post to them. We will then open up the floor for questions from the audience. And we will end with a few concluding remarks from Glencourse from Accountability Lab. And then we will end with a few concluding remarks from our panelists. So let's get started on the panel discussion now. And I will start by asking our first speaker, Emily Raville from Canada to present her views. Uh, Emily Raville is currently deputy director for the democracy policy team in the Office of Human Rights, Freedoms and Inclusion at Global Affairs Canada and has a 20-year career behind her in the Canadian Foreign Service. Emily, Canada has developed an ambitious set of commitments to strengthen democracy both domestically and internationally. Could you tell us a little bit more about how Canada sees the Summit for Democracy process, the value of the initiative in Canada's perspective, and what you hope that the process of the Summit for Democracy can contribute both to Canada's democracy agenda as well as to the global democracy agenda. Over to you, Emily. Yes, thank you, Annika. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, I would like to begin by extending my appreciation to International IDEA and Accountability Lab for organizing today's session. These types of exchanges between governments and civil society are an important element of the Summit for Democracy process, so I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, Canada participated actively in the Summit for Democracy in December 2021 and continues to be highly engaged in the follow-up process leading to a second summit. Both our Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs were involved, with the latter focusing her participation around the Day Zero event on media freedom. Canada issued 35 uh, domestic and international commitments across the three themes of the summit, which were democracy, human rights and anti-corruption. We think a gathering of democratic states was overdue and we are very thankful for the US exercising its leadership in this way. So to start off, uh, just some context that can help to situate how Canada approaches the summit. First of all, Canada has undertaken to make democracy a core foreign policy priority. Although Canada has long championed democratic values, this is an area where we think we need to be even more engaged. And also defenders of democracy need to come together at this critical time. With the rapidly growing influence of authoritarian states, we must seize all opportunities to reinforce the international community of democracies and civil society. We believe actually the summit has already succeeded in several ways. And one of them is the fact we're here today, right? It has brought global attention to challenges to democracy and reminded us not to take democracy for granted. It created momentum for increased cooperation and action by democratic governments, and it mobilized collaboration among civil society organizations themselves, which is leading to increased cooperation as well with governments. The ongoing year of action sets the stage for countries to take tangible steps to strengthening democracy, both domestically and in their international support. Throughout the year of action, we need to take advantage of the existing mechanisms where relevant for implementation and accountability, including through the Open Government Partnership. To this end, Global Affairs Canada is working closely with Canada's Treasury Board Secretariat, which is the lead on the OGP, to ensure linkages between Canada's commitments made at the summit and Canada's national action plan within the OGP. And as Annika mentioned earlier, we're currently chairing IDEA. We are very happy so to use our roles as chair of IDEA, but also of uh, Media Freedom Coalition as co-chair and Freedom Online Coalition to ensure complementarity with the summit and as avenues for engaging all stakeholders. And now in terms of what the summit can contribute to Canada's democracy agenda, so the summit has raised the profile of democracy issues across our domestic agenda. Uh, it required us to engage departments in Canada that typically don't think of their work or their initiatives through the prism of strengthening democracy internationally. But it's clear that these linkages had to be made and, um, and had to be, these have to be reinforced for efforts on democracy at home and abroad. And at the international level, we are already building new relationships to tackle emerging issues through summit-related initiatives, and we hope to leverage this for further norm building. 
We're also in close contact with the US and other partners on the way forward, including on the establishment of the issue specific cohorts that Anika mentioned. And we expect to be particularly engaged on the one on media freedom and on information integrity. And of course, it's crucial that we already start thinking on the efforts after the second summit because efforts will not end with the second summit. I would also like to mention that we heard clearly from civil society that the country submissions, generally speaking, have been underwhelming perhaps. So where appropriate, Canada hopes to use the process to encourage other states to seize this important opportunity that we see here. Thank you very much, merci. Thank you so much, Emily, for these insightful views. Very good to hear that Canada will be engaging in the media freedom and information integrity cohorts. And also um, these insightful views of how the Summit for Democracy process has helped to raise the profile and put democracy on the agenda also of, of Canada's government agencies to help see their work through the prism of democracy. Uh, I think it's been very useful to hear that. Maybe you could tell us also, and I think uh, those that are listening in are also curious to, to understand in a nutshell, maybe if you can describe and summarize the main priorities that Canada has laid out in its own written commitments to strengthen democracy domestically uh, and abroad, and how also Canada has planned to involve civil society in that process. Yes, sure, of course. Uh, the summit took place shortly after the swearing in of a new government in Canada, which allowed, which complicated things, but also allowed for Canada to announce an ambitious forward agenda. And so, as I mentioned previously, Canada uh, announced 35 domestic and international commitments across the three themes of the summit. And these commitments are currently being implemented, and we look forward to reporting on them at the next summit and discussing new avenues for cooperation. Uh, we've made some good progress towards uh, convening a national high-level multi-sectoral roundtable to look at options to strengthen the international legal framework and architecture to combat corruption globally. That was one of the commitments uh, amongst the 35. There are some other items such as establishing a Canadian Centre for Democracy that requires some more time for implementation, but we're working on it. Uh, part of the value of the summit is that, is that it keeps us accountable and focused to deliver on this uh, agenda. And regarding civil society engagement, um, yes, the engagement with civil society is fundamental to Canada. Policy development across the federal government already includes significant engagement and consultation with stakeholders that are based in Canada. Many of our commitments drew from these regular and ongoing um, processes. For example, Canada hosts regular consultations on human rights, and the Summit for Democracy now features as one of the items in these meetings that's discussed there. And of course, we also drew upon the consultations in, in the context of the OGP process to develop uh, and finalize our next uh, national action plan. Also, well, just 10 days ago, ago, sorry, our Minister of Foreign Affairs held a session with leading Canadian expert, experts on democracy, as did our parliamentary secretaries, uh, the one to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and to International Development, and those were with Canadian and international experts on democracy. And uh, we expect to have more regular engagement of this kind in the long term. And finally, because we are, uh, you know, the, the Foreign Affairs Department, of course, we're using the year of action as the basis for our missions abroad to increase their engagement on democracy with stakeholders on the ground there. Thanks, Anika. Thank you so much for, for these perspectives. Uh, really interesting to hear um, both the, 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 the consultation processes that you're carrying out with civil society organizations and how the commitments have drawn from those, also how um, your domestic and international commitments uh, link to each other and form the basis for both domestic and international policy. And I think also an important issue that you raised uh, and that is valid for all countries engaging in the summit processes is not creating new processes, but building on what already is there and, and complementing existing efforts. So your mention of uh, the important linkages with, for example, the OGP, the Open Government Action Plan, and the engagement in the Open Government Partnership process 
uh, as well as the Freedom Online Coalition, I think it's very important uh, because there are already ongoing initiatives in several of these areas and leveraging those through the summit, I think is very important. Um, so thank you so much for these perspectives. I think now we'll turn to another part of the world. We'll turn to Nepal and we'll hear also the civil society perspective of how um, civil society has engaged with the summit process in the Nepalese context. We'll hear from Narayan Adhikari, who is a Nepalese social entrepreneur, governance innovator, and social justice activist. He's a co-founder in South Asia, representative of the Accountability Lab. And in his current position, he's pioneered a number of creative tools for accountability and open government, uh, including pioneering a television show called Integrity Icon, um, as well as um, an open government uh, advocacy movement around accountability for gender rights and many other initiatives that he's uh, led. So we will be very interested to hear from you, uh, Narayan, um, about the Nepalese perspective. The government of Nepal has submitted written commitments to strengthen democracy domestically um, <clears throat> as part of the Summit for Democracy process. So from the civil society perspective, how do you view the summit process and these commitments? And do you think that the process will provide an important tool for strengthening democracy in Nepal? And if so, in what way? Over to you, Narayan. Thank you, Anika. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, this is great. And I congratulate to IDEA International and Accountability Lab for doing this uh, important events. And this is very important and timely. Uh, let me give you a little bit of a uh, little bit of background about how Nepal uh, work and how Nepal works or performs in the space of governance and accountability. If we look at the indicators uh, from the index of public in integrity, for example, we our score is 5.32, which is about you know 50 percent of you know. That shows that there's a there's that needs a, to that needs to do a lot in terms of improving open government accountability, citizen participation, service delivery, and all. So we are really good at uh, budget transparency, and I see there's a lot of civil society uh, working on promoting budget transparency uh, of the public institutions. We are really really low on online services. We are you know, just a half of the score, like 5.5 .5 on the administrative transparency, uh, um, you know, in terms of judicially, judicial independence, freedom of press, uh, e-governance, uh, we are okay. So freedom of press, we are, I think we are, we are, we are okay in terms of the global average. So this shows that there is, a, there is an ample of opportunities to promote uh, open governments, transparency and accountability. And there is also constraint to promote, uh, you know, to promote these areas. And I clearly see the opportunity here through this, uh, you know, commitments uh, mentioned uh, from, from our government towards the summit for democracy. Uh, and relating it to the open government partnership also, uh, Nepal is eligible since its in, uh, inception. However, we are not the member yet, unfortunately. Nepal, uh, I think got, Nepal uh, has got 75 score out of 100 to become eligible for an you know, open government partnership since, begin, big, since the beginning. And it's, it still remains the same. Uh, so, you know, this, this situation shows that Nepal is, uh, you know, advancing, uh, willing. However, uh, there is no substantial results that we have, uh, we have got from the government in terms of, you know, uh, you know, opting open government partnership, for example, um, and to really fulfill the commitments that the government usually made in the international uh, forum, like Summit for Democracy. Uh, talking about the commitments, uh, there are five commitments, the mainly five commitments, and all these commitments are, are very important commitments. Uh, I'm very glad that the Nepal made these commitments 
uh, though I have some comments on the commitment, which I, I will share later, but the commitment number one is to really about, you know, increasing women access to foreign employment, like, you know, ensuring their safety, securities and welfare, uh, as well as, you know, uh, you know, supporting women's, the you know, uh, uh, women's that works on uh, domestic workers, uh, for example. However, we have issue about, uh, we have issue about women's that are, uh, that are wanting to go as a domestic workers in the, in the Gulf countries, uh, you know, are facing, uh, you know, several challenges. And they are, you know, the visit visa for women, for example, are still restricted. Uh, and they are not really allowed to uh, freely move to these countries. There's another commitment is related to migrant workers, foreign migrant workers, again, that the government has promised that they will work with the destination countries, you know, uh, to create an enabling environment uh, you know, for the work, for the Nepali foreign workers, uh, you know, their right to right to you know their human rights, uh, right to get right to fair pay, uh, safety, and and to really end of uh, you know human trafficking and explo exploitation. Um, and the another commitment is about uh, you know you know to to eliminate harmful traditional practices such as child marriage. Dowry, witchcraft, uh, uh, chaupadi, and and one of them were uh, you know to to you know amend the bill against acid attack, for example, which I think is one of the specific commitment that government has made, and we have the acid attack bills. However, the new uh, you know the ordinance hasn't passed it, so um, hopefully it will it will pass in the next parliamentary session. Uh, there's another the fourth. Uh, commitment is about related to transitional justice. So according to the, you know, the Supreme Court verdict that the government should consult with the victims while uh, amending the transitional justice act. However, this hasn't done properly and this is in the process. Uh, uh, and finally, the very important one in terms of corruptions is to review on CAC. Um, because this is a time to review on CAC and to review on CAC based on our new constitutions, international standards, uh, which is uh, which is slightly uh, happened but hasn't got uh, the full picture yet because it requires a lot of consultation from the civil society, private sectors, and other st stakeholders. Just to talking about the commitments, uh, which uh, which we found as the civil society, the commitments are important, but they are vaguely uh, uh, defined. Um, you know, for example, the com commitment that hugely valuable for Nepal is to live with dignity, safe, and prosperity. Um, and I really thanks to U.S. government for providing such opportunities for government, civil society, media, and business to consolidate their interest efforts and advocacy to review, to renew Nepal's democracy, because all these commitments are very, very important uh, at these moments. Uh, you know, SDG, uh, sorry, S4D processes, uh, in, in my opinion, and, and, and also I can say that the, the comments from the several other civil society organizations where, uh, where it happened very quickly without knowing uh, the obligations after you know presenting these commitments. So there's that that you know our government, especially the prime ministers, when he showed up with the commitments, um, thought this is a, simply a traditional speech. Uh, so so without understanding the real process, its obligation to fulfill within the year of action. So they made these commitments. These commitments are important. There are a lot to do. There's a lot to do. This needs to be, you know, uh, this needs to make specific. Needs to break down in terms of what are the indicators that that we can, uh, that we need to work to to fulfill within the year, and how civil society and other stakeholders can help uh, to really uh, make this happen. And and to really, uh, you know, use this opportunity 
to promote uh, uh, you know, the governance and accountability. And also, this is also a, uh, a point to leverage, to, to push uh, the government to opt, to opt for open government partnership. And I see this is, this is an easy entry point. And because Nepal is already eligible, there's a lot we can, we can use as evidence to show that the how government is working uh, already well as an incentives to, to really push for open government. Uh, and, and I see this summit for democracy commitments and the open government's agenda are very similar and they are really helping to each other's reinforcing to each other's. And, and I, would, I would imagine like, you know, uh, the government would have all, uh, government would have also uh, work uh, uh, more with the civil society, had more consultation before, uh, uh, you, know, you know, before presenting these commitments. However, there's a lot to do um, to really make it happen, make it uh, more uh, concrete um, and to really advance our democracy uh, and accountability. Mm, yeah, I, 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 I stop here. And there's the last thing I want to say that, you know, when the commitments were me made um, and, there's a, there's, a, and there's, a, there's a more awareness within the government sectors, especially the office of prime minister. However, uh, I haven't seen any mechanism that look after the commitments. And I see uh, there's, uh, there is a need to set up a mechanism that, that really oversee this process and work with the you know, relevant ministries and departments, uh, you know, provide them support tools and also monitor their progress um, in terms of uh, these commitments and to really uh, work um, to fulfill these commitments within the area of action. So there is opportunities, there are some challenges because this is an election year. We are having local election right now. So there's two more elections coming up in a couple of, couple of months. So the, the priority at the moment for the, the government is more of election. However, uh, you know, these commitments are also not really huge to fulfill. There needs more government willingness, civil, active civil society, um, and, and engagement of a lot of young people to promote innovations, informations, uh, and engagement at, uh, at the local uh, and the, the, the national level. So I stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nariam, for these interesting perspectives. Um, what I'm hearing you saying is that the Summit for Democracy process is an important, provides an important leverage for advancing Nepalese democracy and, um, and its um, potential entry into the open government partnership, um, that it's key in addressing some of the key challenges that Nepalese democracy is facing, but that, that uh, there is also some room for improvement in terms of making these commitments more specific, um, engaging civil society more in the, in the process, uh, also of monitoring the commitments, um, and then also bringing in the, the, the political, the electoral dimension into all this that um, uh, is going to be the focus this year, both locally and, and nationally, if I understand correctly. I have... Um, follow up questions to you to hear more about how to engage civil society in this process, but I'll turn to those after. I think now we'll move over to hear the perspective from Norway. Um, and we have Harriet Berg with us. She's the Director of Human Rights, Democracy and Gender Equality in the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, she's prior to this role, she was um, Norway's General Consul in New York, and she has worked uh, and represented Norway towards the United Nations. Um, and we would like to, to hear very much from, from you, from the perspective of Norway also, uh, similar to Canada, has developed an ambitious set of commitments, both to strengthen democracy domestically, but also internationally. Um, if, if you could tell us a little bit about how Norway sees the Summit for Democracy process and how uh, this initiative is valued, and what you hope it can contribute both for, for Norway's democracy agenda as well as for the global democracy agenda. Over to you, Harriet. Thank you, Annika. And thank you for organizing uh, this, uh, this meeting. It helps us um, trying to define clearer uh, how we can use this process for something that is beneficial for us all. Uh, and and uh, just to, to start off by uh, uh, our engagement in the process and, and uh, what we believe can come out of that. Uh, uh, any, any discussion on democracy these days is very, very welcome. Uh, in Europe, we certainly 
realizing how important uh, democratic institutions, rule of law, human rights, gender equality is for us these days when we have a war ongoing in our neighborhood. Uh, and it's important for us to, um, to continue to work to strengthen uh, democratic institutions, to strengthen um, uh, any rule of law system uh, in our societies, including in Europe, when we see um, the threats from authoritarianism uh, in, in our neighborhood. And so uh, this is uh, very timely uh, and we've been, as you said, using it to come with pledges in the first round, uh, pledges on uh, how to strengthen democracy, how to defend against authoritarianism, how to fight corruption and how to promote respect for human rights. As uh, some of oh, you might already know, uh, Norway has been engaged in um, strengthening civil society and the situation for human rights defenders for a long time, uh, particularly when it comes to the normative development in the UN, but also when it comes to um, working uh, in improving the situation for human rights defenders and civil society on the ground as we call it, uh, by um, supporting organizations and processes. Uh, we believe that human rights defenders play an important, uh, very positive and legitimate role uh, in building an inclusive, uh, uh, sustainable and democratic society. Uh, and in realizing the 2030 agenda uh, on, for sustainable development as well. Uh, and we seek to strengthen the normative framework by having resolutions in the Human Rights Council, in the UN, uh, and in other ways. But what we do realize is that the implementation on the ground uh, continues to be a challenge. Uh, uh, and something that we try to work on. And, and we see this process as another way to try to work on these processes. We have um, said, informed uh, US authorities, State Department, that we are willing to uh, take on the responsibility of sharing a cohort uh, on civil society uh, and particularly on human rights defenders. Uh, and we hope that that could be a way to um, actually uh, improve uh, the situation on the ground, being able to share experiences, um, inspiring for more engagement and more ambitious pledges. Wonderful. This is great news, I think, and not just to us, but everyone listening in to, to hear that Norway will take a leading role in a cohort on, on civil society and human rights defenders. I'm sure there will be a lot of interest for engagement in that in that cohort. Uh, and as this cohort process is just starting to take shape, uh, knowing uh, which governments are taking the lead, I think is very, very helpful for everyone listening in. Um, also important uh, mentioned uh, of linking these efforts to ongoing efforts such as the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, I think is very important to hear. Um, and and hearing the same from you Harriet as from Emily that um, that this summit process what it does one of the things that it does is placing democracy at the front and center of the of the global agenda and of the global discussions and I think that's one of its uh, main contributions so thank you very much for for these um, this perspective and um, I have more questions for you but I'll turn to them a little bit later on and uh, now we'll turn to another um, uh, country and another perspective now from civil society again from Congo DRC a, a very different uh, context actually according to international ideas classification is is the only authoritarian regime that uh, was invited to the summit um, process um, and um, we have Guillaume Mpoko um, from Global Integrity he's co-founder of Open uh, DRC, which is an organization committed to strengthening the Congolese civil society's ecosystem under the principle of open government to advocate influence and enhance the process for Congo DRC's uh, potential joining of the open government partnership. So Guillaume, question to you. Um, we know that the government of Congo has submitted written commitments as well to strengthen democracy at home as part of the summit for democracy process. Uh, from the civil society perspective, how do you view this process 
uh, and these commitments, do you think that they will provide an important tool for strengthening democracy in Congo? Uh, and in what way do you think that the commitments are addressing the challenges that Congolese democracy is facing adequately? And what would be your views on this? Guillaume, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank first the, the Accountability Lab and the International Idea for having me here. Thank you very much. Uh, in my view, uh, the process is an important tool in a way that uh, it opens the window of opportunity for the uh, DRC government to work with the civil society. Uh, on the issue related to democracy, because in the DRC, like you mentioned, is not a free country. So there is no collaboration between the government and the civil society. And this, this was really an opportunity for that uh, mechanism to be effective. Unfortunately, today is not happening. The government is made the commitment by myself and uh, he trying to uh, work with the US by himself without engaging the civil society. And uh, one of the things that we are trying to do is to push on for the civil society to engage with the government and look at this uh, commitment and try to resolve one by one or to assist the government in uh, applying the, uh, the commitment. As of the commitment, Two of them is very important in a way that we think is a tool that is going to help the DRC in uh, improving the score on all the uh, uh, related uh, issues such as uh, uh, transparency, accountability, and uh, uh, civics participation. For which one? The, uh, one of the, uh, the uh, one of the commitment that the president mentioned, sweating of uh, general inspector of finance, national agency for to fight against corruption, a court of auditor and, and criminal. That commitment is very important, is a tool important because we think it's going to improve the DRC score in uh, eligibility mechanism to join the OGP. Because as we know, G o uh, DRC is not part of the OGP. It is not eligible yet. But this commitment, if it works correctly, effectively, it will help the DRC to improve the score, maybe to be eligible to join the OGP. So uh, we saw some kind of uh, 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 improve and uh, progress since 2002, the president funded the general inspector of finance and the inspector of finance himself tried to recruit more inspector. So they, they increase and they, they, they improve their way of um, the scope of investigation. So they're doing good job on that particular issue. So among the five commitment, only one commitment that we can say for the moment as progress, as activity or is trying to improve. The other one, uh, we think that they need more help and they need more um, uh, process. So we are going to follow up to see how we can help discuss with the government and improve the issue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Guillaume, for this and, and interesting to hear but both in Nepal's and in Congo DRC's uh, process uh, in the Summit for Democracy, you both think that the, the commitments that the governments have made are, uh, if they are being implemented adequately, can provide important um, leverage and support for, um, for these countries um, potentially joining the Open Government Partnership. So that, that's very interesting how one global process can uh, provide leverage and support uh, another one like the OGP process. Um, I think uh, we have heard from, from all, all the panelists uh, now various uh, perspectives, both from government and from civil society. And I think what we will do now is to hear some of the, the questions that we have posed for the panelists in the chat. Uh, 
everyone listening in, feel free to make um, questions in the chat um, to the panelists. Um, we'll start with the first uh, question. Um, back to you, Emily. You, you were mentioning uh, at the beginning um, how Canada values the Summit for Democracy process, uh, how you think it's been very important to place democracy at the front and center of the global agenda. You also alluded to the importance of not the process not ending with the second summit that is planned for 2023. How, how does Canada view a potential continuation of the summit process beyond these two summits? That's a very good question. I think uh, the US as lead on, on the summit process is, uh, is not certain how the summit process should continue, whether there, whether there should be annual summits or whether it should become something uh, more um, uh, back to our regular work, making this a priority for all governments without needing to have a summit there behind it. Um, I think the commitments that Canada has taken um, are, are important ones for our government. And it's clear that the work, whether you look at, you know, working with human rights defenders or combating systemic racism against indigenous peoples in Canada, those will not end in a year or two. And it's, it's clear that these commitments, that the work on these commitments will continue um, within the different departments responsible for them. But I think there's also some value at, um, at countries coming together and reminding ourselves of the urgency on this, kind of like for, for climate change. We, we know there's lots to do and we need to discuss it together. What format that takes, I think, doesn't matter so much. And there are so many coalitions and organizations and forums uh, where these important conversations should continue. We, we just need to remind ourselves um, that, it, that we need to stay focused on these. So I, I think there's some decisions to make um, amongst countries with stakeholders, but there's many different ways that, that the work could continue. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Absolutely. We, we hear you on this, that uh, even if the, the summit process ends with the second summit, there are many ongoing processes and global initiatives that will continue as well as domestic initiatives that will continue, that can continue to build on, on, on the summit process. And, and as you say, many of the commitments that have been made by government, most of them actually will, will not be able to be implemented uh, in a year's time. It's, it's too short, democracy takes time and many of these reforms are, are more long-term. Um, so also pointing to the need to, for civil society and other actors to, to continue to, to monitor the summit process even and, and the commitments and the implementation of these commitments after, after the second summit will be important. Um, another question for, for, for Narayan um, in, the, in the Nepalese uh, context, uh, you've been mentioning the, the, the election, um, the local and national level election process this year that will take place. How, how do you think that the electoral processes in Nepal will, will affect um, the, the commitments that have been made in, to the Summit for Democracy and, and whether they um, will, will change the priorities that have been made in these commitments? Over to you, Narayan. Thank you. Good question. Uh, actually, I mentioned it briefly before. Um, you know, I would imagine I would have I would wish the government could have make a commitment around election because the air of action uh, for uh, for ne for Nepal is 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 going to be more relevant because this is going to be our election year. However, in the statement, uh, you know, the prime minister's statement to summit for democracy has mentioned a little bit about election. They say that they're going to be they provide free fair. Um, you know, access to information. And there, there is going to be a wider consultation with civil society, media, uh, and different stakeholders on making electoral process more uh, open, fair, uh, just. Uh, going back to your question about how it, if, how, how might it affect, I would say it, it will affect a lot because at the moment, uh, starting from the local elections, uh, to the to the provincial election and federal election in upcoming months, uh, because the priority for the government is is definitely going to be election, and the priority for the political parties, major major political parties, is is now for elections. This is about you know accumulating powers, and we have 
parties that are divided and the parties that are trying to force an alliance uh, targeting for next election. So um, I would see, I would clearly see that it will procrastinate the summit for democracy agenda. However, some of the agenda commitments uh, might uh, might advance a little bit, uh, but uh, there is a risk that the that it will take long time, less focus, less consultative, uh, you know, less uh, open to the public civil society. Uh, so, like. For example, you know, rev reviewing, you know, on CAC might affect uh, uh, as, or it might advance, but without proper, you know, consultation with civil society and other stakeholders. Thank you so much, Narayan, for, for hearing this perspective. Um, I think, um, some of the criticisms of the summit for democracy process that have been raised are that it's it's a it's a it's a it's a U.S. initiative, um, and that it's not necessarily domestically owned in countries. How would you view this? You are a civil society representative in Nepal, but you're voicing strong support for the summit process and thinking that it can actually contribute to strengthen democracy uh, locally in Nepal and provide leverage for civil society organizations and others that care about democracy in Nepal. How would you view this? Uh, thank you for asking the question. I I had I had thought about it before, and I mentioned this thing uh, a lot um, with some of the U.S. officials, the senior officials, you know, who were visiting in Nepal. You know, the summit for democracy, is, you know, initiated by the U.S. government is a great thing. I I like this, and this is very important, as it uh, you know as it help us. Um, to leverage, uh, you know, from what we are in terms of advancing our democracy, these are great steps. Uh, and thanks to U.S. government, as it provides civil society or tools for advocacy. However, however, you know, I'm a I'm a great fan of interna internationalization, and uh, you know, to really something relate something like open government partnership uh, uh, or United Nations that are more international, intergovernmental. Uh, would be more, uh, I think, easy, uh, more, you know, it will create more ownership among government stakeholders, civil society, and, and, uh, and international communities that it view as a commitment uh, that Nepal is part of international framework and doesn't necessarily always view uh, just like this, this is kind of like, you know, bilateral or one country leading this. And of course, we have people who have a political inclination towards certain countries. Uh, so this uh, also, uh, there is a risk that, you know, you know, why just America is, is taking the, you know, uh, is raising these issues, uh, raising these issues in, in the name of democracy. Why not this international institution like Open Government Partnership, UN and all, of course they are raising, but there is, there is a large number of population here in Nepal they still view that this is a agenda, you know, uh, you know, pushing uh, from the U you know, United States to Nepal, not necessarily a domestic agenda, but I don't see that. However, there is a risk. And that's why I really urge the Nepal government to opt for open government partnership and the US government to work with Nepal, you know, to create an enab enabling environment, you know, promote motivations and, and, and incentives to, in, to really become a member of the OGP and provide a Nepal government uh, enough support to fulfill this OGP commitment. And these all, in all these commitments uh, that are mentioned in the Open you know, Summit for Democracy um, and the future commitments would be uh, from the commitment from the Open Government Partnership Commitment. So that way it will be easier, one sort of one door policy and for government, sometimes it's hard for, for us to, 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 to advocate to advocate is that there's so much of international things are coming up and where we looked at, how we looked at, do we have capacity? Do we have willingness? Do we have a mechanism to support? So somehow it is also creating confusions that what should we follow? Uh, summit for democracy, open government partnership, or there are other international mechanisms. So this is what I want to say. Yeah, thank you. This is really interesting. The 
that there is, uh, even though the process is important and is valuable and you view it as valuable, even though that may not necessarily be shared by everyone in, in Nepal, um, there is also proliferation, a risk of proliferation of international initiatives that create that risk creating confusion. So I'm hearing you that it, the recommendation is really to try to, to uh, focus these, uh, the Summit for Democracy commitments and the process, uh, channeling them towards um, Open, the open government, uh, an open government action plan in Nepal becoming a member of the open government partnership and, and then that way sort of um, localizing the, the agenda and uh, creating more domestic ownership for it uh, also in the long term. Um, Just in like 10 seconds, like what you said that when your mobile laptop crashed, you use mobile phone as an alternative means. So the open, uh, I mean, Summit for Democracy, I see it's a great alternative way to advance our democracy and push for other stuff like open government partnerships. So we need alternatives to advance our dem democracy and the summit for democracy is something like that. Excellent, very good. No, thank you very much. And uh, we have a question here in this chat. We're coming towards the end of our conversation, but we have a question also for, for Harriet and for Norway. Um, people are very happy to hear that Norway will be co-leading a cohort on, on civil society and, and human rights defenders. Um, the, the listener is asking if there are any more details on the creation of the cohort, um, including a time frame from when it will begin, um, wh which organization or organizations may be civil society code leads, um, possible other interest from other governments and, and any possible focus um, of, of the cohort. Harriet, over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, they're all good questions. Uh, we certainly, as everybody, in an early phase uh, and uh, contemplating uh, which issues we would like to concentrate on. Um, I think that to be able to really have an impact and to really be able to have good exchanges or experience and, and good practices and uh, possible commitments um, at the next uh, summit, we need to narrow it down. Uh, so uh, we will have to think about which issues that we would like to focus more on. Our main idea is that we want to use this as an opportunity and a bit uh, like uh, Marianne has uh, described as well, use this as a vehicle to move uh, uh, a process forward. Uh, and then for us, that is the process leading up to the Declaration of Human Rights Defenders uh, in the UN. Uh, it has its 25th anniversary in uh, the fall of 2023. Um, and we believe that to be able to think about how we can uh, fill that with even more engagement and, uh, uh, and ambition um, uh, is something that we can use the process that you're action for. So to be more concrete, we want to have a core group with countries from all regions um, and we are now um, looking at um, who we should invite and, and have a discussion with in that regard. But we think it's important to have a cross-regional core group where uh, at least five states come together to, to chair uh, this uh, together. Uh, and then we want to, of course, have a strong uh, dialogue and uh, partnership with civil society. Then the issue is, of course, that yes, we can be on uh, digital meetings, but still, uh, somehow we need to make sure that we have a representative group of, uh, uh, of civil society organizations, but not overwhelming ourselves totally. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we are looking for umbrella organizations and we are in dialogue with some that can kind of represent uh, more than one organization into this. Uh, so uh, that's also why we thought this meeting was very interesting. And then we hope that we uh, kind of with this uh, have created some kind of first movers coalition uh, that can uh, uh, get us a bit uh, forward when it comes to what are the issues we should focus on in the future. Uh, and then hopefully have have a very nice, uh, energetic, and, and good warming up for our 25th anniversary for the Declaration for Human Rights Offenders in fall uh, in one and a half years. Wonderful. No, this is this is great, Harriet. I think uh, this announcement creates a lot of enthusiasm for everyone that is listening in and that uh, are tuned into the summit process. Um, also, very good to hear that there will be 
core group of, of several countries uh, that will uh, co-lead this together with you and, and, and maybe an umbrella organization from civil society that, that, can, that has uh, ample coverage. So we look forward to hearing more on this cohort. Uh, and as you say, early movers have an advantage. So you, you'll have a lot of attention, I think, um, into this uh, cohort. And we look forward to hearing everything that the cohort uh, is achieving and two more discussions to share progress um, going forward. Um, we are coming to the end of our session. I wanted to have an opportunity given the opportunity to Blank Glencourse from Executive Director of Accountability Lab to say a few words on what he's been hearing from this discussion and to help um, us wrap up the session. Uh, Blair, are you there? I am, thank you so much. Thanks, Annika. thanks everybody. This is a fascinating discussion. So many uh, important points, I think, and I know we're, we're running out of time briefly, but just to, to touch on a, a couple, and I think the overall feeling I get from the conversation and having been, involved in, in a number of these kinds of conversations around the summit for democracy is that that it remains a really important opportunity. Um, this this is a an important political initiative. It is a, a framework that can help push these issues along from whichever perspective we are, are viewing them. Um, and and there are entry points that we can capitalize on. I think from a from a government perspective, it's great, of course, to, to have our colleagues here from, from Canada and Norway and to hear some of the high level engagements that now seems to be happening around this. And of course, that I think is, is key if, if this can become a, a priority uh, and, uh, and governments can, can garner the political will that's needed to deliver on this, uh, that is essential. That is more difficult in some countries, of course, than, than others. Um, but that comes to the point about aligning this with, with other incentives, with other mechanisms, with other processes that that are ongoing, like OGP, of course, which has been mentioned a number of times. Uh, I completely um, agree, but but there are others, as, as we've also touched on, but also having a whole of government approach, which again is easier in some countries than, than others, but but uh, Canada touched on that, aligning different, different government agencies and ministries in, in ways that can lead to uh, to efforts to to support um, these sorts of things rather than du duplicate um, or work in in parallel. From a from a civil society perspective, I think it, it sounds like there's more to do in terms of awareness. Um, Guillaume touched on on that. We in in our community here are talking um, about these things. I think there's a lot more to do to to broaden the reach with civil society, to bring in citizens at all levels to these discussions um, and to make sure that their voices are, are heard uh, and to make sure that commitments reflect what it is that citizens and civil society want, of course. Um, uh, and for, as we've discussed, the, the commitments to be clear, many countries have not made clear commitments. Um, that makes accountability very difficult. Uh, and, and I would suggest, as, as we're trying to do with accountability lab, that in those countries where commitments are not clear, would, that, we, that we use this as an opportunity to push for what would make them clear. If, if a government is making a vague statement about something, let's, let's talk together and, and see how we can make that concrete and provide specific steps that that government uh, and others can, can use to push this agenda forward and, and support democracy more, more broadly. Let me uh, let me end there, but just with a final point, which which I think is um, something that OGP has also learned, which is the value of learning through all of this. Of course, this is the first time this is this is happening. Um, the cohorts and and the sort of uh, issues that you you talked about, Director Berg, in terms of learning across countries and, and really trying to to bring in civil society into into the cohorts in the right sorts of ways are are critical. If we can use this to learn and improve, then uh, not only the year of action but all of our efforts after the the year of action and summit for democracy will be so much more effective. Let me leave it there, Annika. Thank you. Thank you so much, Blair, for these wise insights. Um, I think we we all agree with what you said. That uh, particularly the last thing, this is this is a learning process, and we need to all be humble in this learning process and and gather the lessons learned so that we can improve going forward. Whether we, whether it's in the summit for democracy process or other processes that will continue after. Um, I, what we've been hearing from all the panelists is the the importance of this space of this initiative taken by the US government to put democracy at the front and center of the global agenda really to provide visibility for these for these issues um, 
And I think we all have a responsibility, whether we're in government or in civil society or in intergovernmental organizations to play our part in um, ensuring this process of success. And I think, Naren, you were, you were alluding to also the, uh, that, the, uh, for example, in Nepal, that there wasn't a process for following up on the commitments. I think if the process is, doesn't exist and if it's not built into the commitments, I think we can also think about how civil society and other stakeholders can, can create such processes um, to, to monitor the commitments that have been made and, and ensure their effective implementation. Um, I would have wanted to give the floor to, to all the panelists to, to, to finish, but I also want to be respectful of everyone's time. And uh, we're at 10 a.m. here in Washington, D.C., so we're going to have to wrap up the session. But we just wanted to thank you all so much for uh, participating in this discussion, to the panelists, for giving their perspectives to, to the audience, for, for the questions asked. We're hoping that this is just um, one of many conversations on the Summit for Democracy process where we can share perspectives. I think that the beauty of this conversation, really what I'm taking away, and I think it represents the, 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 the space of the summit process is it brings together stakeholders from very different contexts, from newer and older democracies in the global south and the north, uh, that have different levels of democratic maturity, but we all have something in common, and it's the concern for protecting democracy. And many of these challenges that democracy is facing, they're similar uh, in older and, and newer democracies. So we have um, points in common in a way that uh, maybe we didn't have in the past. Um, so uh, thank you for, for providing this valuable space, for your perspectives, for the panelists, for engaging today. And we'll look forward to many more conversations of this kind going forward. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody.